Good. Okay. Uh, le let me uh, start by thanking Roberto for uh, a, a long introduction. Uh, I enjoyed every word of it, even the part about Alberto. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to share the session with him. Uh, we go back a long way. We discussed all these issues many times. Uh, let me start by seeing what the talk is not about. Uh, it's not about what the title of the session uh, uh, is. The session says macro outlook, and it's not about the macroeconomic outlook. It's about the outlook for macroeconomics. Uh, I suspect that the uh, organizers chose the title to increase the number of uh, people in the room <laughs> and to attract a few reporters. And uh, I, I do apologize, but I'm not going to talk. Uh, about uh, current development uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, I've organized my, my remarks. Uh, this is a slide less presentation, uh, with apologies. But I've organized my, uh, my presentation around five points, which is what was uh, my, it's going to be a very personal uh, journey, what was my assessment of the state of macroeconomic uh, just before the crisis, uh, the second is how I've changed my mind uh, as a result. The third is uh, how I think we should proceed, and all this is said with much humility. Uh, the fourth is what are the specific topics where I think there's uh, a whole lot of work to be done. And then the fifth is more selfish, is what are the specific topics that are of interest to me at this point, mainly as the, as the director of research at the fund. Um, I will not overlap very much uh, with, with Alberto. I'm going to stay away from details of monetary and fiscal policy so that uh, there's not going to be too much uh, repetition. Okay, let me start. So uh, my assessment pre-crisis, uh, here I cannot hide. Is there an issue? One. The immortal words of Albert. <laughs> uh, I, I cannot hide because uh, uh, in 2007, uh, Daron, who is still here, yes, uh, asked me to write a paper uh, on the state of macro and extremely unwisely. Uh, but you, you, know, you, don't, you don't discuss with Daron the same way as. Uh, Alberto doesn't discuss with Maristella, I mean, you just take orders. Uh, and so I, I did it, uh, and it came out uh, in early 2008, just, just before the crisis. So let me summarize what I said there, and you can go and check that I'm not lying. The, first, I said that the state of macro was good, and for this, I got an enormous amount of flack uh, ex <laughs> exposed from Paul Krugman, among others. But uh, I believed it then, and I probably still believe it now uh, with all the caveats uh, which are going to come. The, the argument I was making is that at last, uh, well, two things that happened. I, I, I saw the end, or at least the truth, in the ideological wars uh, which had taken place in macro for uh, a few decades. And I saw convergence to uh, a dynamic uh, general equilibrium law where we could have organized discussions and in which uh, both sides recognized that there were distortions. So we had moved away from either just, say, the ISLM as a model, or the RBC as a model, but to a model in which uh, there were various markets, labor, goods, uh, financial markets. We understood who was doing what, and then we were ready, I think, on both sides uh, to introduce what distortions we thought were important. It may have been a bit optimistic in retrospect. Um, during the crisis, I saw fault lines being stronger than I had thought before the crisis. For example, in terms of the analysis of fiscal policy, there's still an enormous difference between uh, the views coming out of Chicago, say, and the views coming out of, uh, of Cambridge. But still, um, and if I think back to history, uh, you know, the progress from uh, the, the, the hundreds of uh, theories of fluctuations, uh, say, around which existed in, in the early 40s, uh, to Patinkin, which was very nice, but still very static, uh, to uh, the kind of general equilibrium models we have now, I think is definitely progress, and that, that is just not going to go away. Beyond that, 
I thought that we have converged to, um, when, when it came to actual policy discussions, to a small mall, and I'll come back to this, I think small malls are useful, uh, which was the, the new Keynesian uh, mall, you know, the three equation mall, the Calvo equation, the Taylor rule, and the Euler equation. Uh, I didn't believe any of the three equations, but as a, as a discussion device, or, uh, it, it, I found it to be useful. Uh, it was a guy catcher, I think, of a richer picture that we had, but uh, I, I thought it was useful, and I thought that when used for policy, it allowed for uh, much more uh, interesting discussions. So I, I was saying these things at the same time. Uh, I was also saying a number of things which uh, disturbed me. The first is that uh, I kept invoking uh, important distortions in labor markets, in goods markets, in financial markets, but the reality is that we actually didn't know, and actually still don't know much about the exact distortions. I think wage behavior uh, remains largely uh, terra incognita. Uh, we realize it's important, but we don't know how to, to think about it. Markup pricing of firms, which basically gets into I.O., um, IO economists are wise. They don't try to explain dynamics of markups. Uh, Macroeconomists try, and I don't think succeed. I don't think we understand uh, the kind of market structure which generates what we observe. And in financial markets, the fact that we had shortcomings doesn't need to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to be uh, uh, developed at much length. So this was one. I, I thought that where we needed the most work, we really didn't know enough. Uh, the second was, I thought, the methodology uh, which had become fairly standard, was not best. But it was not a good idea to start every single paper with a DSG model in which you added something because you didn't understand basically what beast you were dealing with. It was too complex. And if you thought that an effect was important, you really had to start by identifying it, looking at it in partial equilibrium, and then building it into a model if you wanted at the end. But this was at best the last step that uh, it had become uh, an industry to basically take a model, a DSG model, start from whoever had written the last version, look at the reduced form VAR evidence, say, well, there's this we don't fit. Let me assume that there's a cost to adjusting the second difference in investment, and this will solve the problem. It was completely reverse engineered. Uh, it really didn't make much sense. The same true was, can we find forms of utility functions which will generate the general equilibrium? Uh, out, outcomes we want, that makes no sense to me, and uh, I criticized it. And for the same reason, I, plead, I pleaded for uh, the use of small models, uh, things that you can do nearly in your head, uh, not quite at the beginning, but with a bit of training, uh, the ISLM, Mondel Fleming, uh, Diamond Overlapping Generation, uh, because I thought that, it, and for partial equilibrium models very often, uh, because I thought there was just no way uh, to go that full dynamic general equilibrium to start. We needed basically thinking machines, and these are simple thinking machines which we can use in our everyday work. So I, I think it's a fair assessment of where I was uh, in 2008. And then since then, two things have happened. Uh, one fairly major for the world, namely the uh, crisis. Uh, one much less uh, major for the world, but major for me, is I changed, at least temporarily, uh, I changed jobs and I went to the front and I found myself confronted uh, with many more macro issues than uh, I had uh, dreamed or nightmared. Um, so what I now want to do, let's get to the, to the next point, which is how do these two developments, again, one important for all, you all, all of you and the other just for me, uh, have changed my mind. And here, let me just make a few points. Let me make first an, an absolutely obvious point, and uh, it has been shown today many times, which we had completely missed the complexity of the financial system. I mean, saying this today doesn't get you many points. Uh, we all understand it, but it still uh, should be said. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I went to the fund. Uh, first, I went to the fund two weeks before Lehman, uh, which was good timing. I, I had two weeks to uh, open my boxes. Uh, but I went to the fund thinking of a financial system as a set of arbitrage equations. You know, the Fed chooses the short rates, then you have risk neutral investors, and that basically gives you the whole term structure based on expectations of what the Fed will do. And then you have arbitrage equations for stocks where you have to make some assumption about the equity premium, but maybe it's constant. And you do this for all the assets. 
and I understood that there were thousands of people in Wall Street getting rich uh, working on these things, but I thought they were just you know, the deus ex machina, which gave me the relations I could use, and I really did not need to understand the plumbing, uh, which was behind these equations, and, and very often we do this, and, and we are right. Um, it may be now that what I called plumbing uh, was really institutions, and when you call plumbing institutions, then it becomes uh, uh, clearly something that you should care about. You might not care about plumbing, but you should care about institutions. And it turned out that this way of thinking at it was probably okay for some times, normal times where these relations hold, but clearly uh, could break down in a very major way, and then you had to understand the details as to uh, what all these people in New York City are doing, uh, which I knew very little about. Uh, an anecdote, I, mean, I spent, you know, I would have to, uh, I would have to go in front of the press uh, within weeks of, of, of going there, and uh, I would spend a good, bit, good bit of time a good bit, good bit of time before each press conference or, or interview going to Wikipedia to make sure that I knew what you know, a CDS was and a CDO was <laughs> and what was the balance sheet of uh, Goldman Sachs and things like this. I really didn't know anything. Um, I still have a long way to go. Uh, now, this was clearly my I mean, this was very much my failure, but I think it was fairly uh, representative of a, of a profession of a macro field. Uh, in the sense that the basic model, again, the NK model, didn't have any of that. Uh, and uh, most people, with important exceptions, I mean, uh, Jean, you know, we were, we were given references this morning, uh, uh, Nobu, uh, Mark Gertler, Ben Bernanke were working, there were a few, few macroeconomists, but in general, most of the interesting work, which turned out to be precious during the crisis, was done outside macro, it was done in corporate finance. Uh, and sometimes, let me try to put it lower. Okay, well, if anything happens in Greece in the next hour, I'm not going to know. <laughs> Check for me. Uh, good. So that, that, point is, that point is fairly obvious. I think we all, uh, at least the macroeconomists among us, have to build, plead guilty, and we've understood our sins, and there's an enormous amount of work happening which was presented you know, by, by Frank, uh, by Jean-Charles, uh, by Lars. So it's happening. Now, the question is, was this uh, kind of fundamental flow in macro, or was it just uh, something less bad as a crime? And my sense is that this is not by itself an indictment of macro as such or methodology as such. Um, as has been said today, there are basically, there are going to, always going to be unknown unknowns, to use the, uh, uh, the now well-established uh, terminology. And if you look at the, the effects of the oil shocks uh, in the 1970s, uh, I remember it very well. I was still a kid, and then was not much older. Uh, but when it happened, we, I think, didn't have a good framework to think about it. Uh, the, the notion of a supply shock was not, was not in the mall. And for a couple of years, uh, I think academics kind of looked at what mall could work, and policymakers made major mistakes uh, by basically thinking this was very much a demand shock, didn't change the natural level of output, and so on and so on. Uh, I think we learned, uh, the proof I think that we learned, uh, in my sense, is we basically got in the 2000s uh, oil shocks of roughly the same magnitude. And there the response, uh, they were a bit smoother in the way they happened, uh, but they were the same magnitude, and it had more or less no effect uh, on, on anything. So I think that that is always going to happen. Uh, there are always going to be new shocks. Uh, we don't know where next time, but they'll come. And so I think we have to accept that we're just not going to be ready in time. So I, I don't think that's a deadly criticism. It would be good if we could think of shocks which haven't happened, uh, but human nature being what it is, it's just not going to happen. Uh, the, I think, however, there's, there's a deeper issue which comes from, uh, from uh, looking at the crisis, which is, well, you know, in the case of oil shocks, what we did was to add a supply side, think about how firms price when they use labor and oil, and we repaired all this. It was, and after this, I think it was fine. Is it the same thing this time? 
And I'm not so sure, because there I want to go back to, to the plumbing, which is that I think what we've learned is that uh, the plumbing uh, is actually of the essence. And it's of the essence in the financial markets, but it might be of the essence elsewhere, which is that I, I think the fundamental methodology of macro was to ignore the plumbing everywhere. Uh, assume people had infinite horizons. Yes, they die, but it's not a big deal. Uh, assume perfect arbitrage. Uh, assume all kinds of things. Ignore the institutional details. And in the case of financial markets, we've learned that the institutional details, the plumbing, is absolutely <coughs> essential. And there may be a much larger message for macro, which is that the plumbing, the institutions, are really essential. Now, this, this triggers uh, a, a larger issue. which is that, and to do macro, you have to believe that you can look at things at a relatively high level of abstraction. Otherwise, there's just no hope. Uh, and I think before the crisis, I had convinced myself, but I don't think I was the only one, that what you could do, you could use more or less a standard flexible price model, and then you could add one, one distortion, uh, nominal rigidities of some sort, uh, and then you could have one shock, and it was not, there were more shocks than that, but one shock would go a long way, which is animal spirits moving aggregate demand. And so my view of the world is fluctuations are very much due to movements in aggregate demand, which without the distortion would not lead to movements in output, but given the distortion, given the lack of adjustment of interest rates, lead to large fluctuations in output. Uh, and the question is, is this still a way of thinking about, uh, uh, about macro, and it makes it easy. You just have a simple model. And you understand the distortion very well. You understand the shocks. Where animal spirits come from, you can go at various levels of depth, but you can get somewhere. Uh, and it may be, so my conclusion at this stage, and I'm, I think I'm confused, uh, is that for, it's still the case that most macro fluctuations are of that type. May, namely, I think, shifts in aggregate demand for one reason or the other expectations of good things in the future, optimism, whatever, I think is still the main driver of a lot of fluctuations. And I think the main reason why we get large fluctuations in output as a result is that the interest rate doesn't adjust as much as it would on the flexible prices. So I still think it's right, but it's right maybe 80% of the time. And the issue is that there are clearly going to be shocks, like the one we just saw, in which uh, that particular way of thinking is just going to be wrong. and then. Uh, you have to think about, well, how do you, how, how do you, uh, how do you handle that? Uh, let me see if there's anything else I want to say. I know there's something I want to say, but I don't, want, I don't know if I want to say it now or I want to say it later. Switch. Yeah, I want, I want to say half now and half later. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, if it turns out uh, that, especially for the crises that we care about, like, like the really bad ones, it's the result of many micro distortions interacting in various ways, uh, then this way of proceeding, which is a simple model with one distortion, uh, one shock, may just be wrong. It may be that uh, the more relevant approach is basically to start really with the micro, the interactions, and construct from there, and then the shortcut may actually uh, not work. I do not know uh, how it's going to go, but you could think that these aggregate simple models with one or two distortions are just not, not going to do the trick. You really have to go into, into the, the plumbing again. Okay, let me now move to the third point, which is how should we proceed? So it, here it says humility, and I agree with that. I think I wrote it. Uh, that, and then I make a number of more specific points. So the first is, again, we have to look at the various species in partial equilibrium. Uh, I think the, it is not the right approach to just take something, put it in a DSG to start, and then see what happens, whether, whether you explain um, aggregate fluctuations better. Uh, I think that there, there's an enormous amount of micro work which should be directed at constructing a macro model. So when you have a piece solid and you have empirical evidence and you understand the thing in partial equilibrium, then you bring it to general equilibrium. But I think the first step is absolutely essential. And that has, I think, to a large extent, has to be done by macroeconomists because we know where we want to get with it. 
So it's clear that other fields are providing some of the answers, but I don't think that's something which can be left entirely uh, to, 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 to the other fields. Uh, the other point, yeah, two other points I made here. The, the second is, do, can we still write down uh, models such as, and can we use in our everyday life, models like the ISLM, uh, Mondale Fleming, uh, the uh, diamond uh, of a lapping generation model, uh, or in general, two period models, uh, or, or does it make no sense? And again, I think there the answer is it really depends on what type of shock. Uh, for some of the shocks, most of the shocks we see, I still find in my day, my day work that Mondel Fleming modified for imperfect cap probability, various things, uh, is tremendously useful and at least gives me a way of convincing myself that I understand the data. Uh, it gives me a filter for which I can do it. And, uh, most of the time, I think I do a decent job, again, of convincing myself that I, I can see the world through these glasses. But some of these crises, and especially the last one, is really very different. And then I think that using one of these models uh, may be very misleading uh, because it just comes, the shocks come from somewhere else. They come from two distortions which had been ignored, and they interact in a way which is very different from the philosophy of the ISLM or the Mondale Fleming model. What, what does this imply? I, 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 I don't think we can give up on these small models, but we have to basically realize that there are going to be times where you have to get out of them and, 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 and use different ones. Uh, why is it that I think we are, they are needed? Because I see what people say when they don't have these models in mind. Uh, when you try to talk to somebody who has not gone through the ISLM, has not gone through Mondale Fleming, uh, doesn't understand the basic national income identity, uh, net exports uh, versus saving minus investment, then it is very difficult to have a coherent discussion. And I think what these models do is that they make you respect the identities and tell coherent stories. And I see no, no way of avoiding it. And in my day job, again, I use them all the time. Uh, but clearly, there are going to be times where these models are going to fail. I was thinking of a network uh, remark of Daron. I mean, if we have uh, a shock which basically destroys a network which was fragile with respect to those shocks, then the kind of model that I use in my everyday work is just not going to work and it's going to be misleading. And I think I actually encountered this when I tried to explain uh, the decrease in output in Eastern Europe just after transition, where it was initially, the initial models I wrote down had a big decrease in aggregate demand. It looked like you know, the way to get output down. And then I think over time I've convinced myself uh, that there were basically failures of supply chains for various reasons and that explained much more the output. So the, the model that you know, I wrote with Michael Kramer on this uh, doesn't look at all like an ISLM model, uh, but may have well have been the right model for the times. So I, I, again, here there's, there's no good answer, but there, there has to be flexibility. The, the last point I want to make on this is on the SGs. Uh, there was some snide remark, I think, by Alberto. Who I couldn't decide whether you genuinely didn't know about them or you didn't want to know about them. Uh, but uh, there's a number of people who say DSGs are at the source of a crisis, not, not deviations from the terrible DSGs, uh, because they just led banks to think incorrectly about everything. Uh, and they should be abandoned. Uh, they are basically a failed uh, scientific project. And my answer is absolutely not. Uh, the, the reason is, and again, this comes from my day job, is that when I'm asked what will happen to the rest of the world if the saving rate in China goes down. I can do it in my head with kind of a two country uh, Mondale Fleming or some variation of that, and I'll give you the sign. When I'm asked uh, what will be the effect on the current account of Brazil of a change in the saving rate in China, then wisely I say I don't know. Uh, when we actually need, as practitioners, you know, at the fund, uh, we actually need to have a sense of, uh, of quantitative effect. And although we understand that the DSGs are a long way from being totally reliable, this is a point that Lars has made, uh, I don't think there's an alternative. And therefore, we have to work with them. I think the way we work with them is as uh, interaction devices, which is you take them, you simulate uh, for a shock that you think you understood the qualitative effects of, and then it comes out all wrong, in the sense that it comes out completely different from your priors. 
uh, and then you go back and you say, is it me or is it them? Uh, and uh, sometimes it is me. Sometimes there is a shadow which I had not thought about, some effect of inflation on the real interest rate, which I just not thought about. So that is useful. Very often it's them in the sense that they rely on some aspect of the model that I don't believe, such as too much foresight. And then you go back and you change this. And in the end, it is absolutely true that what you get in the end is for nine-tenths the result of various assumptions you've made along the way in the light of the results of the simulation. So I don't know if you call this scientific. But in the end, you have a model which delivers something consistent with your posteriors, which might be different from your priors because you learned something, uh, and can be used as a description device in explaining to others why it would be good to reduce global imbalances, to take an example. So I, I think they have to be used this way. What they shouldn't be used as is as religious devices, which, you know, there's only one way of doing it, and you have to start with a Christian or whatever uh, specification of utility, and if you do something else, uh, then you're out of the group, and we will not invite you again. And that, 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 that is, but, but still, I mean, these are... I can tell you, uh, at the fund, I find that they are incredibly useful. Um, there are works in progress, but they are very, very useful. Okay, <laughs> let me move to the last uh, two topics. So the, the next one is, what are the topics that, uh, that the crisis suggests we should work on? Uh, here it's going to be pick and choose, but uh, it's whatever. The, uh, so the list is very long. There are all the things which we had not done before the crisis in terms of understanding labor markets, goods markets, and financial markets. And, and again, there is a lot of work. Uh, I think that the result of a crisis, and there was a discussion today, is in terms of behavioral economics. It's clear that the time may have come to actually take it closer to macro in, in various ways. Uh, I think this is happening on the formation of expectations and so on. Let me take, this is just a sample uh, of specific questions that uh, have been struck uh, by in the sense that I did not understand what was happening and I wish I had the time to do more, and maybe you do. Uh, in, in labor markets, uh, I, I would say two things have struck me during the crisis. The first is I expected much more deflation uh, in many countries. And we, you know, we had a sense of a Phillips curve. We know it's not structural and so on, but if unemployment is much higher than the natural rate, then the inflation rate keeps decreasing and it may, the rate at which it decreases when it crosses zero may be smaller, but still. And I think that both in Japan over a long period of time and in any other country I know, we never got to substantial deflation. It seems to stop at 2%, 2 3%, which is very good news, by the way, but uh, it would be important to understand why, why this is happening. And I don't think, I don't think we fully do. The, the other, which uh, was mentioned, I think, by uh, Alan, is uh, the difference in Oaken open coefficients across countries in the crisis. I mean, one of the boxes in, in, a, in a textbook that Roberto referred to uh, says, Oaken's law is one of the most reliable law. And, and, and it says, well, it, it differs across countries because of institutions, but in a country, it's just a constant. Uh, that box will have to be revised. And, uh, and if you've bought the book, uh, you can ask to be reimbursed for that page. Uh, it's amazing how different uh, the coefficients have been in this crisis, very, very large in Spain, where you might not have expected this, very large increase in unemployment for a relatively small decline in output. Uh, in Germany, just the reverse. Again, not obviously explainable by labor market characteristics. You might have thought Germany, be more flexible markets would have more of an adjustment, Spain much less. Uh, the amazing behavior of productivity uh, growth in the U.S., which leads to the reconciliation of uh, Alberto's graph with output being more or less on target. So uh, there, it is so striking that, that we should be working on it. Goods market, uh, I think Frank is actually the one who referred to this, the very large elasticity of trade uh, to, uh, to output in the crisis. Uh, the elasticity is roughly four to five. Uh, composition effects only go some, some way. Trade finance uh, co constraints don't go anywhere, I think. Uh, there is something very puzzling here and very important as well, uh, both in terms of transmission of shocks across countries and more fundamentally about trade and macro. Then, you know, on financial markets, I will not try to make the list of things to be done. 
Uh, there are many people in this room who have started and understand these things better. So last point, which is what is it that uh, at the fund I would like uh, people to work on, both at the fund and maybe uh, in this room as well. So here I actually wrote a paper. Uh, I, I keep writing papers, I should not write. Uh, in 2009, I, I wrote a paper which was called Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy, in which I basically indicated the directions in which I thought we should rethink, not macroeconomics in general, but, but, but policy. And then recently, uh, so this is advertising, the fund organized a, a conference on rethinking macro policy, in which I tried to get people from different sides to come and say, well, given the crisis, this is how I've changed my views, or I continue to have the same views. Uh, on, on macro policy. That's on the net. All the interventions are on the net, and some of them are very, very good. So if you have time to waste, uh, you can go there and just listen. But, okay, what, 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 what would I choose? So uh, to me, uh, the main issue is one which was actually mentioned uh, by Stan in his last remark, which is what I've learned from the crisis is that policymakers, say, monetary policy has many targets. Uh, which is bad news, uh, but it has many instruments, uh, which is good news. Uh, so the targets are inflation and output, which it already had, even if Stan mentioned they de-emphasize output, but they clearly care. Uh, but they also learn, they also care about the exchange rate to some extent. This is reveal preferences. Uh, they care about the composition of output because they have learned, uh, say, in, uh, in peripheral Europe, that it can be very costly. So in effect, there's a very large number of targets uh, they care about financial imbalances, some sectors getting out of sync. Uh, but they also have many instruments. I mean, the, the, day, the day is doing which we thought, okay, the only instrument the central bank has is the policy rate, and being a central banker is meeting every six weeks to decide whether you're going to move the thing by 25 basis points. Uh, it's just not right. Uh, now it's clear that they have this whole set of tools, loan-to-value ratios, which were mentioned by Frank this morning, all kinds of capital ratios, which could be cyclical, liquidity ratios, which could be cyclical, all kinds of, uh, of tools that they can use to affect the behavior of agents. The question is, how do they use them? And uh, to be very concrete, so last week there was a conference in uh, Brazil on, on capital, capital flows, which is how do countries, such as Switzerland, but also some of the Latin American countries, uh, adjust to these very large inflows, which are now coming to them. And there you realize that they have, in effect, uh, five tools. They have monetary policy, so they could decrease the interest rate and so kind of make it less attractive to come, but this has an effect on output and may lead to other heating. They have fiscal, and in the days in which fiscal was wrong to start with, the advice was do fiscal, but in many countries, fiscal is about right to start, so why change it? Uh, they have uh, reserve accumulation, but as uh, I think Steve mentioned, uh, this can be very costly. You, ha you may have to accumulate a lot at very low interest rates on what you accumulate. Uh, then after this, you have macro prudential tools. You can basically tell uh, domestic residents that they cannot borrow in foreign exchange. Uh, they cannot borrow in foreign exchange. And then you have capital controls, which is you say the hell with it. I try to uh, uh, decrease the flows at the border, at least some flows. And the answer as to what you should do uh, depends enormously on circumstances, the way instruments work, and so on. So you basically have many targets, many instruments. And I can assure you that I fear at this stage that uh, we don't have enough uh, knowledge to do it right. And basically, we need much more academic research uh, to get there. Uh, last two points. Something which worries me, uh, which is, I think, in the nature of the beast, is we've learned that we have to redesign uh, regulation, especially financial regulation. But I think, uh, except maybe for Steve, none of us uh, has a good clue as to how to do it. And uh, we don't know what the right capital ratio is. We don't know whether this measure works or not. So this means that the right way from the policy point of view is to put things in place, see how they work, and maybe change them if they don't work. But this introduces enormous regulatory uncertainty and you hear about banks not wanting to lend because maybe the capital ratio is going to be increased in the future. So I think that issue is going to be with us for a long time, which is the uncertainty affecting the decisions of the financial sector. Again, I would love to know more here. The last point, I'm done. The, uh, 
the mandate of the fund is to do multilateral surveillance, look at interactions between countries. And the issue which has come up, uh, both I think conceptually and politically, is whether there should be a code of good behavior. Or can countries do what's best for them? And then the world will be fine. Uh, I think that there had been convergence to the view that that was not a bad thing. That if each country did inflation targeting and net exchange rates move, then the outcome would be quite good. And indeed, we have some models in which this is indeed the case. In the standard new Keynesian model, everybody does his thing, and there are no distortions. The outcome uh, is, 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 is Pareto optimal. The, I think we, we have learned that we have to revisit this. And so this is the whole discussion about can you put capital controls in your country if it has effects on others? Uh, can the Fed do QE2? Uh, and not worry about the effect on Brazil? Uh, can you accumulate reserve in China? And the rest of the world will, uh, will be happy. Um, there are also issues of global liquidity provision, which is when you have these big systemic uh, movements, uh, shouldn't somebody be there to provide the liquidity? Should it be the central banks? Should it be the IMF? Uh, these issues have a, po a policy dimension, that's obvious, but they have a conceptual dimension. They are very tough uh, to, uh, to, to uh, not to crack. So if I can convince just one or two of you in the room to work on these issues, uh, and some of you to apply to the IMF, let me just use the opportunity, uh, that would be great. Let me stop here. Thank you. On uh, GPFE was not snotty at all. I just simply I don't. That's not the field I do. Uh, probably because I'm not good enough. It's too complicated for me. But uh, but although all these models, I mean, I, I was a little bit confused about what you were saying. I mean, at the beginning, you were saying it's not a good way to proceed to start with one of these models and then fix these and fix that and add uh, add an assumption here and an assumption there. But then at the end, you sort of endorse them as the way to go. So it wasn't quite clear how you how to how to how to fit the first part of your talk with with the, with 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 the, with, with the, the second part of uh, uh, of your of your talk. And the second and the second the second point is so what you're saying about many 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 object many instruments many targets that that that's fine. But the, so I think we are back to the which is maybe what we should do. So we are back to the 1970s when we had this model with objective and instruments and we solved them and we have 15 instruments, 15 ob objects. And I think I was studying them in, here uh, in, pol in, uh, in political economics and, uh, and that is fine. But then does that mean that we have, maybe that we should do it? That means we are throwing away inflation targeting and inflation and all that. I mean, how, how does that square with the Woodsworth approach to monetary, to monetary policy? Okay, I think these are two softballs. Okay, let's have that. The, uh, on the DSGs, at least in my mind, there is no inconsistency. The point I was making is that the distortions we introduce in the DSGs should not be motivated by trying to make the DSG fit a VAR. It should basically come from something we know about the particular market we're looking at, and we should do partial equilibrium, and we should get people do the kind of work that Alan does, namely looking at the micro, he identify the distortion of the behavior, and then we can put it in the DSG more. It's just a question of sequencing rather than. Uh, but again, why, why do we need to do it in the second stage? Uh, because at least for practitioners, uh, central banks, the IMF, and so on, we actually need quantitative models, and we just have no alternative. We can't just bullshit about the world and say, you know, we think this is the sign. We have to actually try to get magnitude. So these machines have to be, have to be, has to, have to be built. You have to understand the limits of it. Let me actually make a remark on this uh, about teaching in PhD programs, which is that at this stage there seems to be two types of departments, at least in terms of the outputs I see, departments in which people are taught how to do DSG 
and they get into techniques and they're very good at doing DSG and then departments like mine uh, in which I think people are not taught at all uh, to do DSG and my sense is the people who are taught DSG should be taught, taught the rest which they are not always and more importantly I think people in a department like mine should actually understand what the DSGs are in order to be able to contribute to them. I think that there is a, a separation of culture here which is not healthy. Uh, on, on the many targets, many instruments, you're completely right. Um, and something I said in the, the paper that I referred to is we had a beautiful construction, but beauty is not truth. We had this notion that there was a target, which was inflation, there was a policy rate, and then there was a Lars Venson basically mapping one to the other, right? And it worked. Well, what we've learned is just not right. Uh, no insult to Lars. It doesn't work anyway. So we've learned that, in fact, you have these many targets, and it's true that you have these many instruments. And yes, the world is a tough place, and there's a real risk that we return to some of the mistakes of the 1950s, in which we try to use this, uh, both, I think, because of conceptual failures and political economy failures, which is that macroprudential tools allow you to favor one part of the financial system relative to others, or to punish one part of the financial system relative to others, so that there's a risk that these tools are used in order to do things which we don't want them to do, and they have uh, adverse, <coughs> adverse effects. But I see no way out. Um, it seems to me that the world is like this, and I prefer a central banker who says, I have three targets, and you know, I have a policy rate, I have a loan-to-value ratio, and I have something else, and yes, I'm going to do my best, it's not going to be great, rather than somebody who tells me inflation policy rate. But it's, it's scary as hell, uh, because we, we see what happened in the 1950s, 1960s. Yeah. Still, on, on the first point that Alberto raised, uh, and the answer that, that you gave on uh, how to use DSG, so one uses uh, for practitioners, but why are you ruling out what I th uh, think perhaps people using DSG were doing before, which is to, not to, to, to rig the utility function, that's a, I understand that that's a not particularly useful thing to do, but to understand whether the interactions of different distortions is going to give you the right quantitative uh, uh, replies. And uh, maybe they were looking at the wrong interactions. Maybe they were neglecting the financial market uh, interactions with uh, labor market interactions or, or other kinds of uh, frictions. And so wouldn't that be no, still no. Uh, an important lesson, not for practitioners, but uh, oh, no, for no. all of us? It is, yeah. Uh, practitioners was my angle, but I think one, once you've basically concluded that there are two important distortions, then, and you've understood them in partial equilibrium, then it seems to me the natural environment to put them in is the DSG in which you look at the interaction between the two. Uh, that's precious. Uh, that's another use of DSG that sometimes, indeed, something strange happens and then you decide whether the interaction is really there or not. No, I didn't mean to exclude this. Uh, but again, there's, I think DSGs, maybe, I mean, the, maybe the way to say this is DSGs are, you know, have many uses as well. Maybe you don't want to use the same ones uh, for different purposes. I, one of, one of the problems of DSGs is the pretense of deriving them from first principles and doing welfare analysis. And I think we all understand that that's a joke. Uh, and there's a question of whether we can keep the spirits of the DSGs and some of the discipline, uh, but take shortcuts at various points. What a shortcut mean is not obvious in this case. But. make the DSG fit in the VR. I think that's partly the root of the crisis because what if the VR were, went wrong? If the problem was the VR and not with the DSG? Uh, what I mean is that in a way the VR is son of the DSG because um, what is a DSG? It's a VR with restriction. So why should one take as a benchmark uh, a model in which all you do is remove the restrictions and you know take the linearity. So what if the world is highly nonlinear and the VR is the wrong thing to start from? Tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, VARs, 
I've, I've grown with the ARs. I was very early, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, convinced by uh, Sims that this was a way of representing the data through a linear representation of the world. And then if you were a bit careful, you could do quote unquote structural EARs and you can get impulse responses which made you think. Uh, whether the world is actually linear, whether the number of variables in the VAR is the same as the true number of variables, the number of shocks is the same, all these have been discussed. So it is a dangerous exercise. If the world is fundamentally nonlinear in, in, in ways which are important, this is not terribly useful. But I think if you have to do it. Thank you.